our series talking about the fight. And we talked about as the children of God, we have all come into a fight. We talked about our enemy in this fight. And our enemy was not our spouse. <laughs> yeah, no, better say amen to that one. Or somebody's going over the black eye, right? Yeah, it was not our spouse. It's not our children. It's not the pastor. It's not the person who sits on the other end of your pew. No, we have an arch enemy. His name is Satan. And Satan's goal is to take you and I out. The Bible says he is rolling about seeking whom he may devour. And his goal is to literally kill, steal, and destroy everything about your life and mine. And he does that beginning with us and our mind. And then he moves out into our family and then into our relationships and then into our church and then into our community. And he just goes on and on and on. The effects are far-reaching. I don't even say that we're also in the fight here. As we seek to, and as join together and seek to, we replant this church called Grace Lake Church. Let me tell you why. Because when a church exists for the mission and the purposes of God, it is all about bringing glory and honor unto Him. But when a church is dying, and the church dies and even closes its doors, God's glory is diminished. God's glory in that community is snuffed out. And the enemy thinks he's won. In fact, that is his very purpose, is to get the church to a place where she cannot function, she does not fulfill a purpose, she is merely going through the motions. And let me just tell you, somebody can only go through the motions for so long before people just start checking out and saying, I can't do this anymore. I can't handle this anymore. I can't take this anymore. I got to tell you, I could never stay in a dead church. You see, what makes one dead or alive? One thing. The Holy Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God is in a place and it is moving and alive and full and free, there is a freedom to the worship because the Scripture says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. And when the Spirit of God is moving in a place, there is a freedom. Let me see what we're talking about. There's a freedom in worship, Marty, to lift our hands in the sanctuary. Because if the Spirit of God is bound and restricted and not moving and flowing freely, we're afraid to lift our hands because we're afraid of what other people will think. There's no freedom there. If the Spirit of God is bound and constricted, God forbid we ever clap because they think we were Pentecostal. But the Bible says, Clap your hands, all you saints. How do you get Pentecostal out of it, right? Amen. How do you get Pentecostal out of it? I get Bible out of that. And then you have to do I don't think you ought to have drugs in the house of God, Marty. But the Bible says, praising with the symbols. Praise him with the lyric. Praise him with the tambourine. Praise him with the high sounding symbols. Listen, I have a feeling when we get to heaven, God's got the best set of rolling D5s up there you ever seen in your life. Actually, no, he's probably the real deal. The acoustic all the way and no drum shield. <laughs> Amen? Because in heaven, it won't matter about your hearing, nothing will ever be too loud in heaven. It's going to be perfect. Perfect. You know why? Because we're not bound by these physical flesh bodies. That's the difference. See, when the Spirit of God is moving, watch this. When the Spirit of God is moving and the Spirit of God is flowing and there is a liberty in the house, you don't give a rip who sees you lift your hand. You wave your hands. You will magnify the Lord. That is if you feel comfortable worshiping that way. You'll have no problem clapping and praising God. You'll have no problem standing at your feet and getting up and shouting, praise! 
you're not doing it for anybody else. I was in a church one time, and this little lady came up to me, and she said, Preacher, she said, I know that you're free in your worship, but you're distracting me. <laughs> no joke. No, my second church. She said, you're, you're distracting me. I said, what are you watching me for? You shouldn't be watching me. I shouldn't be distracting to you. In fact, the Bible says that we're to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. What are you looking at me for? Well, when you get up there, she said, sometimes she said, you get to sway them back and forth. And she said, they never know. And she said, you'll do this, this little Holy Ghost dance. And she said, you just stay. I said, I can't stand still. When the Spirit of the Lord is moving, I can't stand still. I want to dance. So I said, oh, whoa, whoa. Did he just say the word dance in a Baptist church? Are you, why are you, come on, why do you know better than that? You should pull me back on that one. You mean in a Baptist church, dance? The Bible says that David danced before the Lord. With all of his might. Amen. Yeah. I'm curious. I wonder what that dance was. <laughs> I wonder if it was like the boot scoot boogie. That's all. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious. I, I wonder if it's some of those new dances. You know, to the right, to the right, to the left. Oh, never mind. Never mind. I was been told, preacher, please don't dance. You're a white boy and you cannot dance. <laughs> you don't have the moves for that. I said, no, my hips don't move that way. All right? I just, I just can't get it. But David, the Bible says, danced before the Lord with all of his might. And he did so to the point that he ripped, the Bible says, he ripped off his clothes. Oh, my Lord. Now, listen. If this preacher over here was off his clothes and dance naked, Marty, please, for crying out loud, pull me off this platform and hide me in a closet somewhere. <laughs> That's what the Bible said David did. In fact, his little lady said, Give God what's wrong with him. He's lost his mind. He has gone freaking. He has gone crazy. That's what she said. To leave him alone. I'm praising my Lord. I'm praising my Listen, when you get to that place, you don't care. You don't care. Now, I, I, I wouldn't care. I, I, I gotta tell you this one time. This is free. This is not even anywhere near. I was preaching one time in this black church. No joke. And uh, it, I'm preaching, and of course, just like I preach, and I'm already steaming and, and going at it, you know. And then my buddy, this black pastor, gets up to the front, and he's walking back in front like they do, you know. And he's getting, he's like, preacher, he's a preacher, 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 come on, preacher, preacher, preacher. Well, the more he did that, the harder I preached. So the first thing I did was I reached, and I grabbed my coat, and I took it off, and I slung it over my mouth. Now listen. You have to watch that being done a couple of times to get that just right. You can't just take it off and just throw it on the side and go, that's how the Bible will do it. You, know? you, you take that thing off and you turn it like this a couple of times. And you just sling it where it lands is where it lands. <laughs> and he kept going in front of me and he kept going, preach it, preach it. Come on, preach it, preach it, preach it, preach it. And I'll tell you, I thought he's going to preach it today. <laughs> Next thing I reach up, I grab my time. I get that.
I'm going to die up here. And I was sweating as much as I could sweat. I reached up. I unbuttoned my shirt. I took my shirt off. I slung it over the side. And about that time, he goes, whoa, preacher. Whoa, preacher. Whoa, preacher. <laughs> there was freedom in the house. <laughs> oh, the Spirit of the Lord was all over that place. Let me tell you something. When you do something for God, when you are all fire for God, when you're passionate, when you are moving the gospel forward, there will be spiritual warfare. You can kill it. You can kill it. So what happens is when you take a dead or dying church and you flip it and you replant that church, what happens is you start reclaiming the glory of God. The devil gets back. You start reclaiming the glory of God. And then you start doing like the, what we used to sing in, 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 in the Baptist church years ago. And Pentecostals got away before we did. But they sing so so morning. I'm going down to the enemy's camp. I'm going to take back what he stole from me. Take back what he stole from me. Because you're not going to die and spend eternity separated from God on my watch. 
That's what happened. You turn 18, you make your decision. That's what he did. Now, I have a cross. Train of a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he shall not depart from it. In other words, I can promise he's coming home. I can promise him, but the pig pen is going to stink after a while. He is coming home. Did I do what I was supposed to do? Absolutely. I believe God will honor what I did. And God will bring myself home because I honored the Lord and I did what I was supposed to do. See, this is what happens. The fact that we have an enemy that is bent on seeing us fail and how we must resist him daily through prayer and the word of God is paramount to our walk with Christ. In 2014, there was a movie that came out of the theaters called The Monuments Men. Some of you may have seen that movie, The Monuments Men. And it was inspired by actual events of a group of Allied art experts during the World War II era. And they were tasked with recovering and rescuing paintings and sculptures and millions of other works that were stolen by the Nazis. These men were not soldiers. Yet they headed straight for the front lines in their quest to be able to preserve centuries worth of beauty and to be able to restore it to its rightful owners. You see, I look around and I realize that the quest of everyday heroes depicted in this movie mirrors the life that you and I are called to as followers of Christ. Like them, we face a ruthless enemy who, like I said, his goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. Like the U.S. government commissions these men to do, God asks us to enter into the battle of life, living for a greater and nobler purpose than self-preservation. I want you to know I don't need to preserve Dwayne Howard, all right? It's not about me. In fact, when this world is over, everything is said and done, when they lay my body either six foot in the ground, or I go out of here flying to meet the Lord in the air, either way, it will never have been about Dwayne Howard. It will always have been about reclaiming the glory of God. Amen. Because that's all that lasts. That's all that matters. Sometimes it means we have to be willing to make the ultimate sacrifice in serving others. I look around and I see that God has given us a mission, and it's one of restoration. It is to point people to God's grace and lead them or disciple them to become fully devoted followers of Christ. And so if you look for the next few moments when you take your Bibles, your iPads, your smartphones, etc., would you look with me at what I believe is a paramount passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21? What does our mission really look like? Today, for the sake of time, I want to read it to you from the New Living Translation. If you don't have any of those copies, it's on the screen provided for you directly behind me. But I want to read it to you, and I want us to talk about it for the next few moments. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. The Bible says that all of this is a gift from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ and we plead, come back to God. Verse 21. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin. So that we can be made right with God through Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, have your will in your way. As I speak from this passage for the next few moments, speak to our hearts, encourage us, build us up, challenge us, motivate us. God, set our hearts on fire, create within us a passion to want to live on mission for you. In Jesus' name, amen. When I read this passage of scripture, there are a couple things I understand about it. I understand, first of all, that Paul is speaking to the Corinthians who are already believers. He is not speaking to lost people. He is speaking to the believers, and he reminds them that we are all sinners in revolt against God. 
God. I believe if we're going to be a grace church, that is the first thing that you and I have got to get down is that we are all sinners in revolt against God. God does not grade sin on a scale of 1 to 10. In fact, uh, what we're told in 1 John is that all unrighteousness is sin. Amen? Sin is sin. So it doesn't matter whether you lie, whether you commit adultery, whether you're addicted to pornography, whether you uh, have uh, a gambling problem. It doesn't matter. Sin is sin. Don't you love those people who get upset and angry with you and they judge you because you sin differently than they do? Don't you love that? Boy, they, they judge you, they condemn you, they tear you down. I mean, they just they just wear you out, they gossip about you, they destroy your 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 uh, uh, reputation, all because you sin differently. Than they do. Your sin might be a little more open. And so I always tell them, be very careful of the size of rocks that you throw. I've seen rocks ricochet off of glass and come back to us to own glass. Amen. See, we all are sinners. We're all in a revolt against God. We are all disobedient. And all of those who are not in Christ, lost, are in need of what we have. Being reconciled to God so that his righteousness would be imparted to them. I am so thankful for the grace of God. When I look at somebody and I see somebody who sins differently than me, I look at them and I never judge, I never condemn, but here's my only thought. Oh, but for the grace of God, therefore go I. Amen. I am never going to look at you, and I'm never going to judge you, never going to condemn you. If you ever come and share something with me, I want you to know, you're never going to get this response. Well, I can't believe you're not spiritual. You are. I don't know what's wrong with you. I don't want anything to do with you. No, no, no. no. Here's what you're going to hear from me. I'm so sorry to hear that. But for God's grace, I'd be in the same place you are. See, we're all capable of sinning. In fact, we're all capable of sinning even in the same ways. Amen. It's just the enemy knows what your hot buttons are and he knows what my hot buttons are. It's real. But we're all sinners. None of that changes. Here's the difference. I just happen to be a sinner. That has found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. That's the difference. A person who does not know Christ, they are without the grace of God. But me, that I know Christ, I am covered by the grace of Almighty God. I am so thankful that when God looks through the portals of glory and He looks down at me and He sees the way of Howard, He does not see me as I. He doesn't look at me and see me for all the wrongs I have done. Instead, he looks at me and he sees the blood of his son, Jesus. I am covered, covered, covered by his blood. Woo! Hallelujah! Man, it gets me excited. I'm covered. You're covered. If you know Christ, you are covered. You are washed in the blood of the As if no sin ever 
never existed there. I couldn't do that. You couldn't do that. In fact, we were sinners bound for hell, and because of the amazing grace and the blood of Jesus Christ being shed, now we are saints that are saved, justified, hallelujah. I can't justify myself. But I'm justified by the blood. I'm justified by Jesus. And I'm being sanctified. May holy. Every day, I'm being made a little more holy, and a little more holy, and a little more holy. It's called sanctification. See, I'm in a process, and you are too. It means daily, he's cleaning us up. He's washing us up. Uh, it's kind of like taking that, uh, that seal. My grandmother used to have these silver uh, dishes and stuff. And she, she's polished those things. I thought, dear God, can you not put them things down? Every time I saw her, she had a thing. And she had this little cloth. And I can never can see the spots. But she's seen one little spot. <laughs> and she'd get that spot until it was spotless. And she'd look at it and she'd turn it and she'd see her reflection in it. She thought that was great. But she'd look at it and her go. <laughs> she did that spot. That's what Jesus does for us. He's holding us. And every time he sees a spot or a blemish, he's buffing it out. He's cleaning it up. And one day, Jesus is going to take these trophies of grace. Oh, oh that's so good. I didn't even able to play sports in my life and be good at anything. But the thing, I'm a trophy. I love trophies. I steal somebody else's trophies and put them on my own. They put me on my own and play on them. They go, oh, boy, you were great at baseball, weren't you? <laughs> yeah. Jesus takes us this trophy of grace. And one day, he's going to present us to the Father. Look here, Daddy, what I got. I got a trophy of grace. This is what my blood did. This is what we did, Dad. Look. God says, I'm pleased. I'm pleased. Understand that Jesus' mission was one of reconciliation. Not vengeance. Not vengeance. Oh, I know the scripture says vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Let me tell you why he said vengeance is mine. Because had he not said vengeance is mine, you and I would have got too big for our breaches and we'd have thought it was our place to bring vengeance on other people. In fact, when somebody harms us, hurts us, breaks our heart, disappoints us, whatever, it is not our place to repay evil for evil. It is our place to love them and let God deal with them. Let God take care of them. Love them, forgive them, let God take care of them. His mission is all about reconciliation. Jesus didn't come to do miracles. Jesus didn't come, you know, to, uh, to, to be able to ride a donkey in so everybody could talk about it for 2,000. Jesus didn't do all these things for all the fanfare and all that kind of stuff. I mean, every, every time Jesus came to town, it was like a, a circus. Can you imagine that? It's like a circus. I mean, they were gathered around. There was all this fanfare. It was just a big whoop de doo It was a big event. But Jesus didn't come for any of that. Jesus came for one purpose. From the moment he entered into this world, he had one mission, and he set his face like a rock toward that one mission. His one mission was to die on a cross, shed his life's blood, so that he could rescue all of mankind. Can you imagine living 33 years knowing that your mission was to die for all these people who were so mean and so cruel to you? Who didn't believe in you. No. It's a good thing I wasn't Jesus. It's a good thing I wasn't God. I looked at them people and I would say, Zap! You know? I'd fry him. You know? Oh, oh you want to make fun of me? I'm put you on a cross. You know? Listen. You know, you just heard that little thing. So, oh, man. Some of his people get on my nerves. 
It's the truth. Aren't you glad we're not God? I mean, if, if really, if we were God, boy, we've been killing some people. Mm -hmm. We've been wiping them out. Lord, it's time for the flood. Amen? Yeah. I'm just telling you. But his mission was about reconciliation. And if Jesus' mission was about reconciliation, look what he said. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. And because he did, verse 20 says, so, or because, or and now, we are Christ's ambassadors. Uh-oh. Brother Tommy Evans a lot away on us. We're ambassadors for Christ. What does an ambassador do? An ambassador represents somebody of high stature. Jesus is about as high as we can get. All right? But we're now these ambassadors. All of us need a sports coat with a big emblem right here that says ambassador for Christ. You know, we walk up and say, flip our wallets. I'm an ambassador for Albert. I'm here on a mission from heaven. I didn't have a word with you. We're ambassadors. We represent Jesus. Growing up, when I was a student pastor, I used to always tell my students, anytime we go somewhere, I said, remember today, there are two things that you need to know. One, you are representing Jesus everywhere you go and everything you say and everything you do. Secondly, you are representing our church in whatever you say, wherever you go, and whatever you do. Now, I can't do much about the first one, but on the second one, if you get called into something stupid and you're wearing our church t-shirt, I am breaking your fingers. <laughs> Sometimes we're not very good ambassadors, are we? Sometimes we're not very good representatives of Jesus. Myself included. See, because we all deal with our own sin. We all deal with our own revolting against God. We're all still in the flesh. And so we are, you heard the Bible say it again, we are saints who are capable of sinning. And we all sin differently. Your sin is not my sin. Matter of fact, the way you sin, I, I probably don't even have a propensity toward that. And you probably don't have a propensity toward the way I see it. The bend toward the way I see it. It's a struggle. And so I want to do good. I want to represent him well. But all of a sudden, see, I deal with this thing. I'm just going to get a confession time. Can I just confess? I know we're live on the internet. And people are watching. And here we are right before you. And I don't know if you've ever really had this before. But I just feel I want to be as transparent as I can be as your pastor. I never want you to walk out of here going, oh, Pastor D, and put me on a pedestal. Because the higher you put me up, the harder I fall. Okay? I'm not all that a bag of chips. I know that doesn't shock you. I just will say that for the record. I think sometimes we need to confess because confession of the Bible says it's healing. Confess your sins once and another that you might be.
where I say, God, this is 25 years ago. I remember time where I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I hate getting angry. I hate losing my temper. Because in my house that you grew up in, I, I won't forget the times where somebody picked up a recliner and threw it at me and missed me by that.
pastor who is tasked with the ministry of calling unrepentant sinners to turn to God for their salvation and be reconciled to Him. Things always amazing. The master normally doesn't obey. And the master walks into the room and everybody stands at attention. They just have that cloud about it. And so, well, we're just people. We don't have that cloud about us. Yes, we do. We come on service for the king. We represent the high king. We ought to have a cloud about us as the children of God that if we walk into the room, there's a holy hush that comes across the room because they recognize something different about our lives. And if they don't recognize something different about our lives, it may be that we're not representing Jesus very well. And a master woman is a bad thing. But Paul does. Paul does. But God is on bended knee, begging lost men to repent and come back to Him. Can I tell you, I believe all my heart, this is the message that we as the church must proclaim and send out to the people. For far too long we've said, it's okay. It's all right. You deserve right. whatever you want to do. Just just do whatever you need to do. It's all okay. No big deal. And here's how we cover it up. Jesus loves you. Love. Why don't we just have a revolution of love? Why don't we just love everybody? And if we just love everybody, everything will be better. There's a problem with that. Yes, love ought to be our motivation. But John the Baptist came preaching before Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance means turn from your sin. Grace is not a license to sin. Yet it is a freedom not to sin. Think about that. Think about that. Grace says, because of God's grace, I don't have to sin. Now, am I going to from time to time? Yes, because I'm a saint in a sinner's flesh body. I'm going to sin, but I don't like it when I sin. In fact, you either, because the moment you sin, the next moment, you feel guilty as all get out, don't you? Don't you feel horrible about what you've just done? Praise God, because that is surefire confirmation that you belong to Him. If you didn't feel bad about what you did, it would just mean that you were a ruthless sinner out there, lost and damned for hell. But because you feel bad about it, because you're convicted about it, it means that you're under the blood of Jesus and you are born again. Children. 
to a thousand times. And I'm going to tell you a thousand and one. The problem is not with the darkness. Quit blaming it on politics. Quit blaming it on the government. Quit blaming it on the economics. Quit blaming it on anything else. The problem is with you and me, the life of Christ. When we're not being good, faithful, obedient ambassadors for Jesus, our flicker is very dim and the dark world will never see the gospel of grace and reconciliation. But when you and I are shining our lights brightly for the world to see, when we are being light and salt to this world, I promise you that people will rise up and people will be drawn to the light. You don't believe me? At night time, you go turn your outside porch light on and see how many bugs come to that light. It's exactly what happens when we allow the light of Christ to shine through our lives in a dark world around us. Local churches and walls that are building to influence the world around us, either because we become like the world that we live in, or we develop the spirit of apathy and we just don't care anymore. And it might just be both. I've watched people walk into the house of God so long. They walk in, they sit up the pew, and they say, Well, bless me if you can, preacher. And then you walk out and you go, Well, that's the worst sermon I ever heard in my life. Well, absolutely. Islam and other religions take over and ruin the minds of our loved ones because we sit back and we don't do anything. We, we do do anything, preacher. Have you not noticed that the cults of this world and the religions of this world that oppose God, they are out here on foot, on bicycle, they'll do whatever they got to do to give the false gospel to people. Listen, Islam's everywhere. They're, they're building this
We're to see to it that nobody misses the grace of God. It's going to take you and I to rise to do it. What kind of an impact could we have if we prayed and acted as if Christ would return tomorrow? And we had a little time to get the message out. I dare say that you know, a lot of things we would not go home and do this afternoon. I dare say we knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow. You and I would get out of here as quick as we could, and we would be on the phone, we would be in somebody's home, we would do everything in our power to tell them about the grace of God, hoping that they would give their heart and life to Jesus. So I don't That there are people who have never heard the gospel within our reach, and that there are lots of people who've been hurt by religion and are making no difference for the gospel's sake. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Today, I'm asking you to join the team. I'm asking you to make the commitment that you're going to serve in the ministry of reconciliation, of calling sinners back to God. Listen, the mission is clear. Come on, pray. Seek and save that which is lost. Will you? Will you? Does it not bother us that right this minute people are dying? Here's what I heard. Well, 
is not what Paul meant when he said, I will become all things to all people that by all means I find this. We don't become like the world to win the world. In fact, the Holy Spirit sets us apart so that others might desire what we have. What about us? Are we going to let people around us in our lives die and go to hell as well? And they cry about it when they're there? See, when they die, it's already over. There's nothing more you can do. Well, I just hadn't had time, Richard. I, I just hadn't had time. One of these days, I'm going to call, but one of these days, it'll be too late. And when they're spending hell for eternity, it's too late to cry. It's too late to wonder, why didn't I do that? But you, why we didn't do that? We are so worried about being self-preserved. We are so worried about us. We're so worried about our preferences. We're so worried about what we want out of life. I want to have a 